continue where we left off. All right, so we are in chapter six, ladies and gentlemen. We left off basically uh, in a kind of a, I guess a midway, maybe not a midway through the chapter six. Uh, chapter six is on cultural values uh, and particularly on behavior, okay? So there's been a number of um, models that we have been examining, okay? And I think the last model that we stopped at was the uh, Edward T. Hall's model on high context, low context, okay? That's on page 220 in your textbooks. That's where we stopped. So that's kind of where we're going to pick up. So I'm hoping that the high context, low context model makes sense to you. I don't know if you've noticed this in your own life, in your own experience, that some cultures simply do not talk a lot, okay? They just don't say much. Uh, they allow sometimes the silence to even speak for them, which is okay. You know, it is a way of communicating. Um, it, it's just in their culture, um, context says a lot more than words can say. And people are allowed to interpret that context and that sort of allows people to have this communication without saying anything, essentially, which is really weird for Westerners. Really strange, very unusual. Westerners are completely uh, phased by this to the degree where they cannot um, be comfortable with it, okay? But for a lot of people in the East, that is a normal way of communicating. Uh, it makes total sense to them. So uh, a lot of times you'll notice there will, there will be kind of this East and West split Okay, in when we talk about models of culture, when we talk about certain um, sort of say cultural paths and presuppositions, a lot of times there'll be a difference between East and West. It's not a really the best way to categorize things, but it's a very simple way of categorizing things. So a lot of times, uh, if you look at the high context, low context cultures, you will see that the high context cultures are like Japanese, Chinese, Korean, African-American, Native American, Arab, you know, and then it keeps moving away into a low context where the, like the German, the Swiss, the Scandinavian, and North American are the very, um, you know, a low context cultures. Uh, and that's, you know, the, that's kind of a sliding scale if you want to think about it. And so people from uh, the low context cultures will rely very heavily on words to communicate everything they say. Uh, where people uh, from the high context cultures will not rely on words. They will rely on context, on settings, on surroundings, and things like that. Um, okay, so does the high context, low context cultures make sense? That's the question that I have for you. Um, so, sorry, getting phone calls here. For some reason I thought I had it shut off, but it didn't. Um, does it make sense? Uh, if anyone has any questions, you know, uh, if I asked you to explain it to me, would you be able to explain it to me? Is the is the question that I'm basically asking? <laughs> um, it's it's a pretty major model uh, that I simply want you to know about. Um, it will come, you know, handy to you in um, in life in general. Um, so. No questions. All right. So let's move on to uh, the next section is um, Hofstede value evaluations. Okay. So uh, this is a conversation that we have already started a little bit uh, before, and we're actually continuing a little bit more. Um, the This is another historical model, okay, uh, that's been around for a while. The one of the major categorizations of how we sort of say look at people's behaviors uh, is along the line of individualism or collectivism. You know, do you come from an individualistic culture or do you come from a collectivistic culture? And depending on that, okay, what is like your major orientation essentially when it comes to that? Uh, aspect of life, you know, depending on that is how you will communicate, you know, why we're studying this in communication class is because uh, your communication is dependent on your culture 
And so if you come from an individualistic society, you will communicate a certain way. If you come from a collectivistic society, you'll communicate in another way. All right. So um, individualism, of course, is when you're oriented, when a society or a culture is oriented on uh, a person, on your own, sort of say, identity as yourself, okay? Uh, where self, individual, is important. And so most of the things in the individualistic culture will be judged, is this good for me? What do I want, okay? What are my goals? What are my hopes? What are my aspirations? So that's very common, again, in the individualistic society. However, in the collectivistic society, it's the other way around. Everything is oriented not around the individual, but around a group, a larger group. Uh, people do not speak in terms of I as much. They speak in terms of we and us a lot. So, um, Collectivistic cultures tend to emphasize community, collaboration. Uh, it's all about shared interests. There's a lot of harmony, a lot of tradition, you know, public good. It's all about sort of say fitting in really well into the society. Let's put it this way. Uh, where on the individualistic side, it's the opposite. It's, it's all about your personal rights, your personal responsibilities. It's about being private. It's about wanting to do what you want to do. Freedom, you know, uh, self-expression, you know, uh, that those are the types of ideas that are promoted very heavily in the individualistic society. Okay. So, um, uh, what do you guys think? Uh, where, where do you fit in? Um, would you categorize the culture in which you were raised and brought up? more you know i realize there's not a clear cut sometimes we're more or we're less if you're saying which direction are you leaning into are you leaning into individualistic society or are you leaning into collectivistic society what what do you think in your personal kind of upbringing culture where you were growing up where you were raised anyone just jump in let me know if you were to analyze where do you come from Uh, I think uh, maybe here a few years ago in the past we more we was more collectivist okay. but right. now I think we are more individualist okay. thinking or myself and right you I know I don't know if I thinking right but you're becoming more individualist because that's what you're surrounded by yeah right yeah and that, and that means you're adapting yeah. You know? So the way, yeah, that's right. you were, the way that you were raised is much more collectivistic, is what you're saying. More about group benefit and more about fitting in. How does this help everyone else? You know, not less about your personal goals and more about the goals of everyone else around you, like your family, your community. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense, Alison. So, but now you're adjusting and you can see that in your Yeah, I'm uh, yeah, adapting, yeah. <laughs> individualist. Because that's yeah. what you're surrounded by. It actually is a normal process. Adaptation is absolutely necessary in order for you to do well in the society. You, if you don't fit in well into the society in which you are a minority, you're going to struggle and you're going to fight yeah. and you're not going to succeed. And so, yeah, it makes sense. You're doing the right thing. You're adapting. <laughs> but it's okay not to lose some of your collectivistic thinking. All right. You can retain that part of your culture even maybe within your smaller community, you know, smaller circle of friends, family that you're around, you can still <laughs> switch back and forth is what I'm trying to say. Okay. I actually find myself in the same exact, you know, um, situation where I come from a collectivistic culture myself. Uh, and I have been in America for quite a few years. So I have been adapting quite a bit. In many ways, I have sort of say adapted to individualism. Uh, but I do find myself thinking a lot of times in terms that are not individualistic. It's very easy for me to see the other side. Let's put it that way. Very easy. Yeah. All right, anybody else? You guys want to jump in? Mm. Hey. Fabio, all right, go ahead. Hey. Uh, I agree with, with Edilson. 
and a long time ago, we are the more uh, college vision. Uh -huh. But now I think so the the a lot of problems or a lot of change we have uh, been our culture and the people thinks in no no I uh, thinks in in yourself and another others because uh, I I think this this families is separated individualism i don't mm -hmm. know but i think so today we are individualists yeah american society is highly individualistic yes so if you're going to be in america you're going to be affected by individualism unless you are choosing to completely segregate yourself Mm -hmm. and separate yourself from everyone in America and just be around people from somewhere else. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and if that's your choice and if that's and if you can do that, then you actually will not be affected by individualism as much. But everywhere you go, work, school, uh, grocery store, doesn't matter. <laughs> you will be affected by individualism. You can watch TV and see advertising. It's all going to be about that. Um, it, it doesn't matter. So you're right. You're right. Uh, Fabio, I mean, a lot of problems that we have, you know, are do stem from our individualism, because one mm -hmm. thing that individualism does to us is it pushes us apart. It creates us standing by ourselves. And it actually fractures families. If you're if you're used to a more cohesive family unit mm -hmm. where everyone spends time with everyone and focuses on joint activities you know, doing things together, if that's your focus, if that's your culture, that's where you come from, then all of a sudden being brought in an environment where everyone does their own thing. Mm -hmm. And for holidays, nobody gets together anymore. They just, you know, if you have a big family, let's say you have several families, you know, you have kids, grandkids, you know, mom and dad. And so like all of a sudden everyone comes home for the holidays and they have a big celebration, a big huge party or something like that. And, and that's like, normal but all of a sudden in america oh i only see you three times a year we only live you know a few miles away from from you but uh, i see you three times a year on big holidays and that's it and the rest of the time i stay by myself we don't necessarily spend a lot of time together anymore why because that individualistic culture is set in and it pushes you to focus more on yourself and more on you know what you need to do to achieve your goals and all of a sudden people fade into the background and you know that you know for somebody who comes from a collectivistic culture and they're used to that uh it could seem very um negative actually very disruptive disruptive very uh you know uh, certainly not positive and, and almost discouraging that like, oh, people are staying away from me. They're being antisocial or something like that, where before we used to spend all this time together and now we hardly see each other, you know, what happened, you know? And so it does create a certain amount of disunity, uh, especially if you are from uh, that type of culture. Uh, for other people, I just wanna let you know, Fabio, who, who do not know that side of culture, uh, it it's it doesn't feel quite as bad because yeah. that's all they know. Okay, yeah. so to them that's normal. What? Uh, oh, sorry, Peter. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about the the growing up the technology, the uh, like cell phones, uh, informat internet? I think so. This has been separated the people, and yeah. the, the love has been frozen. Yes, that is part of the problem. And I will, I'll tell you this, technology it does two things. One of the things that it does is separate. Why? Because what it does, it makes communication impersonal. You no longer talk to me, you text me, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so rather than talking to me and seeing me, you text me, you message me. Um, and so that makes it impersonal. But there's another aspect that technology does that is a positive aspect and actually brings people together. Okay. Mm -hmm. So technology is just a tool. It can, it can do both things. 
uh, it's the question is how we use it. Yeah, I will tell you this, that technology has allowed people to stay in touch that have not been been in touch very much because of the great distances, for example. Yeah. Uh, if someone is separated from their family or they're separated from their culture, they can be living in the middle of nowhere. As long as they have Internet, they can reconnect with people of that culture and they feel they can feel support, you know, mm -hmm. from yeah. them and and maintain some sort of a, you know, cohesiveness in their life. When you're really outnumbered, when you're a minority, you seek people who are like you. OK, and that is one thing that Internet and technology actually allows us to do. It allows us to connect with people who are like us, regardless of how far they are. Yeah. So I just want you to see that there's both positive and negative sides to this. Uh, but do I do agree with you that it creates this separation? And what it does, it replaces human contact, okay? It replaces it with digital contact. And that is probably what you see, you know, as more negative aspect. And I agree with you. It, it does. I, I like human contact. Um, a, and so, yeah, the times are changing. <laughs> and the way yeah. we talk to each other is, is changing. But um, it's all about how we use technology and how much. And how much time do we spend on different things, you know. And so I see a very negative, very destruct, dis destructive aspect of technology that is being in our society today uh, that maybe affects you, maybe not so much. Uh, Americans, uh, by and large, are very heavily affected by this, um, so to say, kind of, you know, self culture of self-promotion, like Facebook, you know, posting stuff on Facebook all the time, updating things all the time. Uh, it feeds into the individualist ego very easily. Somebody who comes from a culture that's not individualistic, they're not as easily trapped into that. But for somebody who is very individualistic, where life is all about you, well, I just gave you a tool like Facebook where you can make it all about you and you can talk about yourself nonstop and share with the whole world all the wonderful things that you are, you know. And the truth is, majority of people don't care because they care about themselves more than they care about you. So you have a bunch of people advertising themselves and promoting their personal life and personal things. And most people do not care. But to us, to a person who is doing it, it's very important. So when somebody goes in on your page and clicks like or thumbs up or something like that, all of a sudden that makes your day, right? You feel good. You feel, oh, somebody likes this. I posted a new profile picture. And I got 25 people who clicked that they liked it. Oh, that makes me feel good. <laughs> it feeds into our individualist ego, essentially. And so, and that, but it's not real. And that's, and that's, you know, that's the aspect of it. So anyway, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying, the concern that you're raising. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this, on this area, but, um, and I don't mind discussing it a little bit, but uh, it is related to, you are right to pick up on it. It is related to our orientation, whether we're more individualistic or more collectivistically oriented. So we will feel a different level of comfort uh, with these things. But I think technology is developing and growing so fast. Uh, everything will change in a few years anyway. So who knows, you know, who knows what's next? Um, it's, it's very fast. All right. So, um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone is on um, on board understanding the differences between collectivism and uh, individualism. It really is basic, it's a basic orientation. Um, in some cultures you have a chart, you have a table 6.4 on page two, um, 224 that kind of shows you how countries rank on uh, their scale of individualism or collectivism. So if you're curious, look it up, check it out. Uh, you could see that some people, uh, some countries rank very high and some countries rank very low. So that will tell you which countries tend to be more collectivistic and which countries tend to be much more individualistic. All right. And so, and of course, understand that 
by countries, we mean the majority of the population of that country or the native population of the country, however, you know, you want to describe it, but it's kind of predominant culture, not necessarily representing every individual, of course. So all of this data is, you know, nuanced by that. But you could see which countries rate really, really high and which ones rate really low, like United States and Australia are both ones, okay? Uh, you know, one, you got Australia number two, Great Britain number three. So you could see that they're really high ranking. New Zealand, you know, Italy, Belgium, uh, these are very collective and very um, individualistic countries. Uh, where then you look at countries like, uh, you know, Pakistan and Indonesia, all of a sudden, you know, Singapore, Thailand, <laughs> West Africa, these are really uh, much, much more collectivistic cultures. They couldn't. They couldn't be more different, you know, in how they see life working, you know, as far as it comes to uh, more of a communal orientation or more individual orientation. All right, enough about that. Let's get into uh, the next um, criteria that um, uh, is uh, presented here to us from the Hofstede, and that's uncertainty avoidance. What in the world is uncertainty avoidance? Well, this is the best way that I can explain it, is that some people do not like uncertainty, okay? Who likes to be uncertain? Imagine you meet somebody and you don't really know, uh, you don't really know if they like you, you don't know if you like them, uh, you don't know if they are mean or hard, you know, harsh with their words. You, you don't know how to treat them, basically. You don't know how to approach them. Uh, you don't know quite what type of relationship you're going to have with them. And this is, for some people, people overcome uncertainty uh, with greater rate of success and with less trouble. Other cultures have really hard time overcoming uncertainty because they are so proper in their etiquette because they have to treat each other with such a way of respect. It's very hard for them to form a new friendship or a new relationship. Just meet a stranger and start talking, for example. For some people, uh, in some cultures, just to meet a random stranger and just start talking to them without introduction, without knowing anything about them is really hard. I mean, imagine, you fly, you fly somewhere, you get a seat on a plane, and right next to you is this person. You have no idea what this person is like. You have no idea what their character is like. You don't know if they're pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, maybe they are absolutely not like you. Maybe everything you like, they hate. You don't know. You're sitting right next to that person for the next five hours, okay? And let's say they try to talk to you. How uncomfortable would you feel is the question. Well, by answering that question, uh, honestly, you should be able to identify for yourself what level of uncertainty of avoidance does your culture um, basically um, put into you. Some people deal with the situation okay. They they're not comfortable. Nobody's 100% comfortable meeting somebody. There's always a little bit, you know, little bit of, I don't like not knowing everything about this person. Always, for everybody. But some people are okay with it. Where other people are almost paralyzed by this fear of doing the wrong thing or making a bad impression or saying something that offends that individual, or you know, our other people are not. They they don't care if they offend somebody. You know, you're sitting on a plane and a person starts talking politics, and you know how polarizing politics is, right? You know how everybody argues about politics all the time. And so, what if you are on the opposite side? Now you're stuck to this person for five hours, and they're gonna ramble on about their political views, which you do not embrace but you're too nice to tell them to stop talking and, go, and, and stop annoying you. Why? Because your sensibilities of what is proper and improper telling you you can't do that. So you sit there and suffer. This is exactly the kind of situation I'm describing where people would be you know, trying to avoid uncertainties. So there are some cultures 
that would rather avoid this situation of not being certain, they would run away as much as they can from this feeling of discomfort. And there are things that they will do in their society that would take that away, okay? So societies that have really high, um, you know, hierarchical structure where status is very important, for example, those are the ones who are going to have very high uncertainty avoidance. They would want to minimize any sort of uncertainty in their lives, where other societies that have low uncertainty avoidance, um, they tend to be much more tolerant. They tend to be much more open-minded. Um, they tend to be more diverse societies. So they're used to tolerating people of all sorts, let's put it that way. So cultures that are more uniform, where everyone is more the same, okay, more homogeneous cultures, um, have very high uncertainty avoidance. They do not want to meet somebody who's not like them, let's put it that way, which is why they're more the same than different. Where other cultures that are very diverse, where everyone is different, um, they're okay because they're actually used to that and have developed cultural ways of learning how to tolerate each other with all of their differences. And it doesn't bother them as much. So that is another, um, sort of say criteria, another dynamic that you have to consider. There's another chart on um, page 226, 6.5, table 6.5, that shows you uh, some of these uh, countries that have uh, different levels of uncertainty avoidance, okay? Some countries simply, you know, would like to avoid any type of discomfort when it comes to not knowing or not expecting what's going to happen in a conversation between strangers or something like that. Okay. And so you could see how the countries rank there as well. Um, again, we have a very sharp split between East and West. Um, this time, I guess U S is not at the top, uh, but you could see some countries, have very high uncertainty avoidance and others have low uncertainty avoidance. So it's an interesting chart, but at least it tells you something about how different cultures deal with this idea of strangers, people you do not know, tolerating people who are not like you. Uh, you could you could see how that how that works. All right. Um, and some of these categories might surprise you, but this was this was a pretty pretty big study, so they're uh, they're quite accurate. All right, so um, let me look at uh, the next category here: power distance. We're still looking at Hofstede's value uh, dimensions, and so power distance. What in the world is a power distance? Power distance basically describes how people orient themselves in positions to each other. Um, does the culture where you come from has a great distance between, you know, bosses and employees, subordinates and managers, you know, people of high class and people of low class? Do they mingle ever is the question. Or do they live like in a completely different world and they never really cross each other's paths? How much of a distance is there between people in power and people out of power? Okay, and how much power you have a lot of times has to do with your status or your job position or your wealth or prestige or whatever. So this is what we call about, you know, power distance. How much power distance uh, does your culture teach? And I want you to think about this, you know, where you come from, your own personal individual cultures. Do people of different classes interact together, you know, or not? How far away do they stay apart? Can somebody who is, you know, can a president of the company go out and have lunch with some lower tier manager, you know, or will he only go out to have lunch with vice presidents of the company and that's it? You know, that's the question. Will there be any social contact between people of different class, different category? or will there be none? 
And do the people recognize that? Do they, do they get treated differently? Do they recognize what status they feel they fit into and are they treated, you know, differently? So, you know, this could, this could mean a lot of different things. This could be uh, your family name, it could be education, it could be your profession, you know, does, does this intermingling happen or doesn't? And that is, again, a question you have to ask about your own culture, where you were brought up, how you grew up, what were you taught, you know, of how to interact with people from, you know, different stratus of power, let's put it that way you know, or prestige or whatever you want to call it. There's, you know, power is just a, just a construct. It's just an idea that we're trying to, you know, use to define these types of relationships. So is it, is it minimized or is it maximized? Do people make a big deal about their position and their status in your culture or do they not make a big deal about it? Because if they make a big deal about it, it just means that it's very important to them and that's how they see themselves. That is the picture they want to portray and that is the picture they want to see you know, uh, of themselves. And that's how they orient themselves to everyone else. Or is it you know, the other way around? Uh, do people see themselves as superior as other people in your culture because they are wealthy, more important or whatever, or do they not, you know? Is everyone pretty much more or less equal? And the status matters, why? Because it gives you certain things, of course, but it doesn't matter as far as the individual goes. People are people, so to say. And, and this is where you are gonna, again, are going to have huge difference between cultures. Or some cultures are very stratified and they will not have any kind of, you know, where it's understand, this is your place, this is my place, this is who I am, this is who you are, and we're not the same. And you don't treat me like your buddy, because I'm not your buddy, because I'm above you or something like that. And then so in some places, it's like that. In other places, it's the other way around. Now, how does this affect communication? Well, it affects communication hugely. Okay. So, uh, because people, if they feel that they're on a lower status, they will feel uncomfortable communicating with somebody that they perceive to be of a higher status. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. They're going to feel completely uncomfortable with that. And in fact, they will not do it. And that means communication now breaks down. Where it needs to happen, it doesn't actually happen. Why? Because people feel that they're not supposed to be communicating that way okay so that's the that's the idea so uh low power distance high power distance you know just look look to those so um it's all about what the perception in a culture is like where do you fit in on the on what which level are you at you know and uh, some people emphasize that in a big way other people do not so, so anybody wants to share just for fun, uh, if you can ad identify your culture, where you come from, do you come from a culture that has a very clear distinction, you know, boss, employee, you know, high ranking, low ranking, you know, we talk to you, we don't talk to you, or, or do you come from a culture where everybody's more, more or less the same? And it's okay to talk to people regardless of the level of where they are, you know, are there some people just unapproachable because you are not quite on their level. What do you think? Where do you see yourself? Share with me. Well, actually, I experienced uh, the both uh, situation is a low power distance uh -huh. and the high power distance. And that, that was it depends on my job in my country, in yeah. South Korea. And the once I was worked uh, in ma a magazine company. The editor is uh, the highest, uh, I mean, the ranking em employee, employee, but and the, he was really open-minded. So we not, I was the lowest, but and the, I didn't fit the huge gap of the high, low distance. But then the later I changed my job and I worked as a public servant and I was the lowest one. And then it was, uh, 
I bet that is a, the high power distance, but in the that uh, the company was really conservative. The atmosphere working, I mean, working atmosphere. So, for example, when the high slanking was waiting in the ele- in front of the elevator, and then if I was really in hurry, I couldn't get in first. And also, <laughs> and the high ranking, uh, high ranking officer never push the the button. We have to push, it. <laughs> and the, he he or she should stand in the middle, and the, we have to hold the the elevator door until he let let go first. So it's kind of uh, so uncomfortable. But and the way I used to be, because I mean. Whether the high ranking officer is older than me or younger than me, it does not matter. Right. You are the, the high ranking officer. So whenever he, whenever uh, we work together, we should avoid to stand the, of uh, to stand the, uh, to work. Uh, I mean, first then him, then I mean. Then I mean the high ranking officers. So it was so I mean you know uncomfortable. I mean situations. So many uncomfortable situations. Total sense. And the examples you give are perfect examples. I really am glad that you're sharing that. So you've experienced both sides, and you understand how it works both ways. So of course you understand that America comes from a low power distance. You know where if you're working on 15th floor of such and such company, and the you know, CEO is happening to ride the elevator. It's okay to ride an elevator with CEO. <laughs> it's okay to push buttons and nobody's going to look weird on you or think strange or you're not going to get fired. You know, nothing like that is going to happen because, again, in America, it's different, you know, because America has a low power distance and the, the rank does matter. You know, we can't say it doesn't matter. It does matter. You know, when you're the boss, you're the boss. But people are people and they get treated with respect a lot of times regardless of their rank, you know, because it's just the Americans see it as a human decency, you know, is that, hey, there's another human being just because, you know, they work under me or for me. That doesn't mean I can treat them like nothing, you know, it. So there's that, you know, uh, in a Western societies, a lot of times these values are like that. So, yeah, this is a great example. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that you're sharing with me some really, really good uh, experience. So I, I know that most of you have experienced either one side or the other side, or a lot of times both sides, because you probably have been around people who come from these types of situations, these types of cultural settings. And so you can understand how valuable it is to you as a communicator to be to have a clue of where people stand. If you can perceive this about a person with whom you're talking, if you know that most cultures who are in this part of the world will most likely feel this way, and most cultures in this part of the world will most likely feel that way, <clears throat> then you're saving a lot, a lot of trouble to yourself, basically, by not making a mistake of mistreating them or treating them in a way that they're not comfortable with or not giving them the proper respect, because in their culture, respect means this. And that's how you have to do it with them, because otherwise they feel that you are not being respectful enough, which in your culture may be completely different. But that's okay, because in communication, the primary goal is to be successful, right? To be understood, to achieve your goals. And so if you have to, you know, give up something by adjusting a little bit uh, to someone else's culture to achieve your goal, why not? That's, that's what we do all the time because what we want is success in everything. And, um, and sometimes that means recognizing how people work and letting them be who they are. Um, and so being a better communicator a lot of times involves that. All right, awesome. Great, I'm glad that we're on the same page here. You guys understand this idea. Another dimension that uh, the book presents is masculinity and femininity. Uh, this is something a little bit more harder to define, but um, I think um, 
I don't know if it's even fair or not uh, of how the authors describe it here, but they do talk about some cultures being more feminine and other cultures being more masculine. And by masculine feminine, they're kind of feeding into the stereotype that masculine culture is where people are taught to be assertive and tough and, you know, uh, focused on achievement and material success, getting things done, you know, kind of like that's more of a masculine aggressive i want it i'm gonna go get it kind of culture okay so some cultures are more like that and that's regardless whether you're men or a woman it's a cultural value that basically says this is how we should orient ourselves okay where the other cultures are tend to be more modest more tender more concerned with everyone else and everyone's feelings you know uh they're more you know sort of say seek harmony over achievement let's put it that way you know if, if you and i are going after the same job you know it's like people going through the door and they say who's going to go through that door first after you no after you no after you and they keep going no you go first no you go first they're trying to be nice to each other when the end one of them is going to have to go th through first right two people one door it's one of them is going to have to go first so the question is how long they're going to stand there you know, and, and so at some point, somebody's going to have to go first. Uh, so this this idea of some cultures being more um, <clears throat> more reserved, more moderate, more harmonious, seeking to, you know, be more sensitive towards each other, where others are more like, it's about me, I'm going to go get it, I'm going to achieve it, I'm more aggressive, I'm going to, I'm going to be the first, I'm more competitive, you know, things like that. So I don't know if it's um, even a fair way to characterize it this way, but you remember when we talk about masculine and femininity, these are all just concepts. These are ideas. It's not to say that this is how things should be. It is how they tend to be, and we're trying to find the right words to define what we're seeing uh, in culture. So um, in some cultures, both men and women are supposed to be modest and reserved and tender and, and kind of quiet, you know, where the, in other cultures, both men and women are supposed to be loud and obnoxious and outgoing and, and powerful and sort of say aggressive. So <clears throat> tell, me, tell me your perspective. You know, have you met people who, by whom you have been um, sort of say surprised? Maybe some of you guys, um, uh, that have come to America, maybe you've met some people, some women perhaps, that have acted, in your opinion, not where, very women-like, too aggressive, too, too assertive, too powerful, you know, too in-your-face kind of, you know, uh, behavior, the behavior that you probably would think is okay for a guy, but for a woman, you found it kind of, you know, improper or off-color or not right or some, something didn't didn't make you feel comfortable about it. About it. Uh, there's a lot of men who come to the United States that sometimes meet women who have that sort of a culture where they're very much in your face, very much assertive. And so a lot of times men have problem with that. That's one of the biggest sort of say issues that I see with people coming from other cultures to us, facing somebody, facing a woman from a culture that is deemed to be masculine oriented culture see what i mean and the other way around is true as well of somebody coming to from a masculine oriented culture coming to another country uh and facing men who seem to not be competitive who seem to not be aggressive who do not show this spirit of I'm going to go and I'm going to get it. I have these goals that I set and I'm going to ch achieve them at all costs and whatever the price I have to pay, I'm, I'm going to do it because I'm going to be the best kind of an idea. You know, sometimes we come into a culture that is, you know, more along, you know, this other trajectory and we say, why is everyone so passive? Why everyone is so quiet and tender? They don't say what they think, you know, things like that. So, Maybe you have experienced something of that variety. So I don't know if femininity and masculinity are the right words to even use for this, but, but that is how the authors kind of, that's, those are the terms that they picked 
uh, to try to describe certain um, cultural dimension that exists. Um, American culture is very masculine oriented culture where people are aggressive, you know, a um, lot of competition. Um, and where uh, <clears throat> other cultures in the world, some of them are very nurturing, very tender, very sort of say understanding of each other, uh, where people are much, much more concerned with what everybody else thinks uh, besides of what is good for me, kind of an idea. So you can see a lot of these things are actually interconnected, like individualism, collectivism, things like that. They, they tend to fall together. So anyway, so these are uh, different uh, dimensions in, um, of, of culture that anthropologists observe. Um, <clears throat> there's another dimension that they present, which is a little bit even harder to understand, actually. Uh, the short long-term dimension, um, where uh, basically the authors say that some cultures have a much more long-term orientation, where other cultures have more short-term orientation. And so what that translates that to be is how much do you invest into a relationship, you know, and how fast do you move into doing business with somebody, for example. Somebody who, from a long-term orientation, they invest a lot into a relationship before they start doing any business at all, or, you know, they have to have this really long period of knowing somebody before they can trust somebody or do anything, you know, of worth with them, where in other cultures, it's, you know, you seem to move a lot faster because you're not concerned about the long term, you're concerned about the short term. So again, these are two different orientations um, <clears throat> that are that, that's, uh, that's uh, under the uh, Hofstede uh, uh, dimensions that he presents. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, I actually think uh, these are pretty helpful in how we can analyze, you know, cultures, even our own culture. Remember, I told you that always look <clears throat> always look at your own culture, always look at yourself, because the more you know yourself, the more you understand yourself, the more you're able to understand other people who are not like you. And knowing yourself is actually very helpful. If you know where you come from and how your culture tends to be, you can then discover cultures that are not like you and appreciate them for what they are. Okay. Um, uh, there, the next section is Minkov's cultural dimensions. Uh, these are a little bit harder to make sense of. So he has several um, several dimensions, like for example, uh, industry versus indulgence. So it's more much more along the lines of um, you know underdeveloped uh, societies versus uh, well developed societies. It has to do more with economy. Um, so what he has noticed that some people in uh, more developed societies focus much more on indulgence, meaning doing something nice for themselves, taking a long vacation, leisure, investing, investing to them, having fun and enjoying themselves is way more important than, you know, being productive, let's put it that way. And so, and then of course, cult people in cultures that are less developed, that are less affluent, that do not have as much wealth, uh, they're focused much more on industry and focused much more on hard work. They don't seem to prioritize vacations or fun time, you know, uh, leisure activities. And so that changes culture. Again, an indulgent cult culture, you know, uh, says, oh, it's okay. I'll spend whatever I have to spend on this. Oh, I know this you know, this jacket costs so much, that's all right, it's worth it, it's really nice, you know. And, and the reason why they say that is because they have money. And somebody from a more industrious culture says, no, 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 I can't, I can't afford that. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to wait for a sale or something like that. I'm gonna wait until it goes on clearance then I'll buy it, you know. Or maybe I don't need something that nice anyway, this will do just fine. So. You can see where one person's value pushes them towards more indulgence, another person's value pushes them from more of sacrificing something that they want for the sake of being more conservative, more thrifty, more economically, you know, uh, conservative, basically. So <clears throat> this is true of, of many areas of life, you know, um, 
of indulgent cultures versus industrial cultures. Now, the next uh, category that uh, Minkov presents is a little even harder to understand, in my opinion. So he calls it monumentalism versus flex, flex humility, uh, which is kind of a made up word. Um, so monumentalism, of course, has to do with monuments, people who feel very proud of themselves. Um, people are very much uh, focused on their achievements. You know, they feel like I've reached this goal and this is it. That's that's the top. Versus the other one is is a mixture of words, self flexibility and humility. So people basically mm -hmm. exercise much more humble approach to uh, to life. So how much are you going to tout your own achievements, basically, versus how much you're going to be uh, humble about it and not make a big deal about your achievements? So it, how important is this to you? Um, how much do you self-promote your, you know, your importance? Okay. Uh, some people are more falling along the lines of monumentalism, and other people are going to fall along the lines of what he calls flex humility. Okay, and you could see there's a table on on uh, page 233, uh, table 610 right there. And it's a very interesting, you know, list of criteria that they have created here. Um, so again, if you want to understand cultures, why people are the way they are, uh, this may help you and this but this may also help you to see the um, the opposites like let's say let's say let's take uh, one one feature right here from this chart number three truth is absolute or truth is relative this is one of the biggest ar philosophical arguments that are out there is there such thing as truth you know a lot of people say oh yeah there's truth but how they define truth is different is truth absolute or is truth relative and some cultures would say yes this is what the truth is and there is no other truth and this is it there this is the one true right way and everything else is wrong well that's a culture that takes an absolute approach where another culture would say no um, it's not like this. This is true, and this is also true, and this is also true, and that is also true. In fact, all of these things are true in their own way, and none of them are exclusively true. Now, that may drive you crazy, you know, but that is how a lot of times uh, people look at life. Now, uh, when, when people have a serious cultural crash, so um, is, is when they're... they're culture teaches them that truth is relative and then they become Christians let's put it that way which teaches them the truth is absolute they have a huge culture clash in their own mind within their own personality they have to either adapt to accepting the claims of Christianity which are exclusive for example uh, versus they have to be flexible and allow the those claims not to be as loud which would basically undermine christianity because christianity is exclusive you see what i mean you see how this can create a conflict within people so imagine somebody coming from a hindu culture right I mean, just imagine you know you have somebody from a hindu culture and they become a christian and all of a sudden, they have to believe in one God. And everyone around them believes in many gods. And they have to believe in one God. And they say, there's only one God. And your family members will come to you and say, yeah, okay, so fine. So Jesus is God, but so is this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And they go, no, 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 no. He's one and only, none other. And they're like, why would you do this? I'm accepting your God, but you won't accept mine? See, this is where the conflict starts. Now you're going to have a huge fight in the family. I'm being kind and nice to you by including your belief into my system and saying, that's all right. We can work with it. But you're being mean by saying, no, only your way and all the other ways 
are false. So you have an open-minded versus closed-minded. You have absolute thinking versus relative thinking. And that becomes a huge culture clash. In fact, if you want to know, this is one of the biggest issues uh, in India today between Hindus and Muslims. That is the biggest argument they fight over all the time. Of course, Islam is like Christianity, says this is how it is. This is the truth, and this is the only truth, and there can be no other truth. Now, you can understand that in Hinduism, it's much more diverse. There's many truths. This is true, and this is true, and that is also true. If, we, if you read the chapter uh, that we were going through on Hinduism carefully, you probably noticed how uh, there's many paths that all lead towards the same goal, essentially, right? Uh, everything leads towards enlightenment. Uh, you know, and, and so all of these, you know, ideas that Hindus have are tolerant of other ideas. They're not exclusive. This is not the only way. You can go this way, that way, that way, and still get there. But in religions that are much more absolute, like Islam or Christianity, no, there's only one way, and this is the only way you're going to get there. And all the other ways do not lead into that direction. And so you can see how you can have a huge conflict and I'm just picking on one little feature from this list you can go through you know other uh, you know aspects you know here's here's one I'm picking from list just for fun suicide is unacceptable suicide is acceptable what do you think monumentalist culture will say suicide cannot cannot happen uh, unthinkable cannot it's just unacceptable socially on any perspective does it happen yes do we like it no do we, we agree with it no we don't like it we don't want it we don't agree with it it's wrong you know that, again that's what monumentalism you know sort of say is going to say where they're in uh, other culture that's much more flexible they're gonna say oh no it's just fine if that's what people need to do that's what they need to do do you see how people will be split on this idea? So, and it doesn't even have to be a religious idea. It can be a cultural idea. I realize that the religion feeds into this, uh, but um, it could be just a, just a social idea, a social construct. And so culture which you come from, regardless of the religion, sometimes will teach you these, these things that it's okay or not okay. You know, let's say Japanese culture. You know, what do you think? In Japanese culture, suicide acceptable or unacceptable? What do you think? I think Japanese, they uh, think suicide is one of the way to prove themselves uh, innocent. Yes, it's honorable. Not only, not that it's just acceptable. In some ways, it's the preference. It is the best way sometimes to prove your point. I'm a good person. I'm going to kill myself. To a Westerner, if you say that to an American, they're going to say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> How does that prove anything? You're dead. You're gone. <laughs> you know? So, I'm, like somebody from a Western culture does not understand that type of thinking at all. It makes no sense to them. And so you could see how in Western society, life is one of the most important things. You fight to preserve life. To simply end your own life makes no sense. You know, just think about all the emergency vehicles we have in hospitals where we save people's lives. People go on a list so that they can get a kidney donated, a heart transplant, all these things. The, the medicine that was developed in Western society to save people's lives is, you know, enormous. The amount of money people will spend to save a person's life just to give them another year or two or three maybe you know they're very sick but they're going to spend massive amounts of time and, and money to preserve that person for another year for another two years for another three years we're in another society that doesn't look at life the same way they're going to say just let them die why spend that much resources to keep a person alive another year well, what's what's another year? That's not important. Let him go. You know? 
So you see how these types of decisions that people make are actually driven 100% by culture and by what culture says is right or wrong or proper and proper or how people are oriented. This is how much culture drives us to feel a certain way, to believe a certain way and act a certain way and behave a certain way. And all of that uh, essentially filters down into uh, communication. All right, um, another, uh, let's see, another dimension that Minkoff presents is exclusionism versus universalism. This is another one. Um, kind of similar to what we talked about before. <clears throat> Basically, um, it talks about how exclusionism is when you have very little communication between people uh, within the same culture based on their group membership, basically. Okay. And universalistic orientation, of course, is the opposite, uh, where everyone is treated more along the same line. So this is very similar to the high power, low power distance. Uh, ideas that uh, was in Hofstede's model. So this is Minkoff's basically version of the same, uh, where he just calls it exclusionism versus universalism, where people are excluded based on being a part of a group or not being a part of a group, uh, or they're included regardless of being a part of a group or not being a part of a group. Where so that's that, you know, excluding people versus including people based on their class or position, or, you know or status where they are. Uh, so another um, aspect over here that is presented uh, by yet another group of anthropologists is the concept of tight and loose cultures. It's an interesting way of looking at things. So what do they say? Loose cultures are characterized by weak societal norms and they have considerable tolerance for deviance from the expectations. Meaning you can do different things in the society and nobody's gonna be so upset about it. If somebody decides to paint their house purple on my street, you know, or something like that, people are not gonna be upset about it. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm using a bad example because we live in a society where we have uh, covenants and restrictions in our neighborhoods and things like that. But, you know, if I want to paint my house purple or blood red or something like that, <laughs> can I do that and get away with it? You know, or will people, will my neighbors come and be angry? <laughs> what does it matter what house I live in? I, I like blood red. So I'm going to do everything in blood red. So, uh, and so that's, that's loose society. A tight society will exhibit a very strong established societal norms and they will have a low level of tolerance for any sort of deviations in society, which means if this is how we are as a people and you're expected to be this way, if you don't behave this way, then you're, you are deviant, you're different, you are outside of the norm and we're gonna treat you as such basically. So basically conform to the, our collective way of what's normal or we are gonna, mistreat you and ostracize you and and that would be a tight society versus a loose society where if you don't conform to how everybody else you know uh organizes their life you're still okay you're not going to be treated you know differently or persecuted for say people might not you know like you on a personal level or disagree with you but that's not going to affect of sort of say your societal standing so much you're allowed to be uh, different and weird and strange and things like that. So uh, things like that. So that we, we, we come up against these cultural divides all the time. Uh, I think you guys raised this, this before. Uh, I think, I think somebody raised this before in class with the whole issue of like tattoos or something like that. People getting tattoos or people getting tattoos on their faces, and places like that. You know how in different cultures that has been seen as very very negatively and all of a sudden you have people who don't fit into that they want to have art on their face and it's permanent and it's ink and it's not going away <laughs> so uh where other people who come from let's say an aborigines culture where they do these types of things and it's normal this is their expression of their tribal identity or or it's meaningful to them where you know it just different people have 
different tolerance, so to say, for these types of things. So, uh, and societies will, you know, either regulate it or not regulate it. So uh, in our society, people tend to regulate it. In America, where we live, um, there are certain jobs you're not going to get if you have tattoos all over your face. It's just not going to happen. You know, they're not going to hire you for certain jobs just because what you've done with your face. <laughs> so, or, you know, some companies, you know, will allow you to have all the tattoos you want as long as they're not showing. So, but you cannot show them, display them, so things like that. All right, um, let's see where we are in a textbook. Just want to make sure we're getting not too far. Uh, let's let's take a pause. Let's take a break, and we'll come back. Um, and uh, let's say ten minutes. Walk around, stretch out, grab a coffee, sandwich, whatever you need to do. Um, we'll come back, and we'll pick up uh, the rest of the textbook. All right. So take a short break. Don't quit on me. Just just uh, mute yourself, and uh, you know, turn off your camera, and take a little break. All right. So 10 minutes, 10.18 right now, 10 minutes.